So good morning and welcome to the second day of the workshop. I'm glad to introduce uh, two of my colleagues who work extensively in education technology, as I mentioned yesterday. Uh, my right is Professor Sridhar Ayer, so welcome Sridhar. Uh, and Professor Sana Murthy, welcome Sana. Thank you so much, first of all, for agreeing to this. I'll just take two minutes of your time to tell you very briefly about their accomplishments. Uh, Professor Sridhar Ayer actually is an IIT Bombay product uh, from his B.Tech to M.Tech. Uh, sometime in between, he went to U.S., came back and pursued his Ph.D. He was a teacher at IIT Guwahati. And uh, when he decided to move back to Mumbai for family reasons, I was able to convince him to continue the academic profession. That's how he came with us. He has been with IIT Bombay for more than a decade and a half. Uh, yeah. He's actually an accomplished researcher in networking, but somewhere down the line, he got deeply interested into the educational processes. And when the intensive program in education technology started, since its inception, he has been contributing to it very significantly. While you will know about his uh, accomplishments in educational technology research, I would like to mention just one small thing, which to me is important to show his passion for education. He got interested in how to educate young children well in schools on use of computers. So he initiated a magazine called Computer Masti, which became a book. And there are a series of books now available for different standards. In fact, he has set up a separate company to handle that. But that contribution in my mind is equally important. Of course, to us, what is important is work in education technology. So he will be talking to you about actual learning and he will also take the last session in the flip classroom. Professor Sahana Murthy, he, she has actually worked in physics education research in MIT before she decided to come back to India. And currently, she happens to be the only full-time faculty member for our interdisciplinary program in education technology. In fact, when she came back, at that time, I was just trying things out with the early design of the clicker. And it was she who helped us to understand the device better and its usage, in fact, much better. So I'm thankful to her for participating in those activities right from the beginning. And she has been a wonderful part of our team, particularly giving strong inputs onto the appropriate pedagogy for use when we extensively use technology in our teaching learning processes. So over to this duo for the day. The key idea behind today's session is not so much of what we learn as computer programming, but a lot to do with how we want to teach computer programming. So this is a lot of it is from what will we do in the classroom perspective. Okay? So one of the things that uh, we want to understand here is this concept called active learning. Okay? So the key idea here is that often as teachers, we are focusing more and more on ourselves, right? We say that how do I do, how do I improve my lecture, how do I explain something better, how do I ensure that students are able to follow something. So a lot of our effort goes towards improving our own delivery of the lecture. So the idea behind active learning is to say that, okay, while that is required, while the teacher's delivery and diction and precision, all of that is required, what is important is how much are the students learning? Are the students actually learning? So that is the basic idea of active learning. So let us consider a series of teaching learning scenarios right now. Okay? So in the first scenario, the teacher lectures on a topic for one hour. Okay? And the students simply listen. So, so there are some teachers who are very good at doing this. They will grip the students for an hour. The students will listen to them enthralled completely. So that is one scenario. The next one is that the teacher lectures, but now every 20 minutes she pauses and asks, did you understand? So are you getting it? Is it making sense? So now when the question is asked, some students nod and some students are going to give some feedback to the teacher and then now the teacher resumes the lecture. So we can all identify ourselves as 
having done these things sometimes. In the third scenario, the teacher pauses every 20 minutes and not only asks did you understand, the teacher also asks do you have any doubts. Okay. So, at this point some students may say that okay, I have a doubt, then the teacher may clarify that doubt and then the teacher may resume the lecture from that point. So, the teacher asks do you have any doubts, students raise their hands and then teacher clarifies the doubt and resumes the lecture. So, that is the third scenario. Okay. So, in the fourth scenario, there is something slightly different that happens. So, every 20 minutes now, the teacher asks students to clarify their notes with each other. Okay. So, she says that okay, each student should turn to their neighbor and discuss their notes. So, for the past 20 minutes, suppose I have been talking about the topic of arrays. After 20 minutes, I will say that okay, now it is time for you to switch and look at what is the, what is it that you have understood, look at have you missed something of the notes and discuss between the students. So, that is the fourth scenario. The fifth scenario, what happens is the teacher lectures on a topic for 20 minutes and she then poses a real life application problem based on that topic. For example, we may say that having lectured on the topic of arrays, we may pose a problem saying that okay, now given an array of integers, devise a mechanism to ensure that the array is in increasing order. So, that is an example of a real life application of whatever topic that is being considered. Okay. So, students now discuss in groups of 3 and 4 and devise a solution to the problem. So, the important thing here is that this cannot be done within a couple of minutes. So, the students spend about 20 minutes devising the solution to the problem. So, in this case, in the case of arrays, the solution would be of coming up with some sorting algorithms and the students invent or rediscover some sorting algorithms and then the teacher wraps up by conducting a discussion of challenging points and summarizing the solutions for sorting. So, that is one another scenario of how the teacher may teach a topic. And then there is one more scenario where the teacher starts the class with a two group debate on the pros and cons of two methods that was taught in the class. Okay. So, for example, the teacher may have taught the topic of arrays as well as the topic of linked lists. Okay. So, may have introduced the notion of implementing a stack using both an array as well as a linked list and the teacher now starts the class with a two group debate on the pros and cons of the two methods that was taught in the class. So, one group would do the pros of arrays and the other group would do the pros of the linked list when is it good to use an array versus when is it good to use a linked list. So, students now here work in groups to come up with the pros and cons. This again takes about 15 to 20 minutes and then teacher summarizes which is a better method for which situation. So, for example, if we want to simply do insert and remove from the top of the list, then it may be easier to use a linked list. On the other hand, if we want to be able to randomly access the items, if we want to be able to access items based on in index or if we want to be able to do a binary search on the sequence of elements that we have, then the array implementation may be better. So, the teacher will summarize things like that and then poses a more complex problem. Students then choose one of the methods and then solve that problem. So, the problem may be now saying that okay, implement, come up with a implementation of a stack using an array or come up with an implementation of a stack using a linked list. So, the students actually work on it and come up with the functions of push and pop on the stack with these methods. So, to summarize, there are all these scenarios that we are talking about. So, the first scenario the teacher simply lectures, in the second scenario the teacher lectures and periodically asks did you understand, in the third scenario the teacher lectures and periodically asks do you have any doubts. From the fourth scenario onwards, the students are talking to each other in some manner, the teacher lectures and asks the students to clarify their notes with each other, then she asks students to discuss devise a solution to the problem and in the last scenario the students are also debating. Okay. So, keeping all these scenarios in mind, these are various types of teachers you may imagine that 
these are various types of teaching styles. Now, let us ask the question. Okay, so, the question is, so this activity that we are performing is called think pair share. Basically, there are three phases. There is a think phase, there is a pair phase and there is a share phase. So, what we want to do is that in the teaching scenario, some things are changing from one scenario to another. Okay. So, what you want to do in the think phase, the think phase is something that you need to do individually. Each of you will have to do this. Write two quantities which are increasing. So, the idea here is that do not talk to anybody yet and simply think about it on your own. So, I will put back the scenarios right now. Look at the scenarios and write two quantities that are increasing as the uh, as the scenarios are going increasing in the increasing order of the scenarios. So, in some centers it appears that people are just sitting. So, what I would like you to do is to please write down the scenarios. It is not possible to get this concept of active learning by simply sitting or by talking to each other. So, what you are required to do at this point is to write two quantities which are increasing across these scenarios. Okay. Think individually and write two quantities which are increasing. Okay. So, assuming that all of you would have at least come up with one quantity which is increasing. So, what you want to do is now in the pair phase which is the next phase, turn to your neighbor and compare your answers and together come up with at least one change which is related to students. What is changing in terms of the student behavior or the student actions and one change which is related to the teacher. So, this is the exercise that you have to do in a pair. So, turn to your neighbor, compare what you have written, what your neighbor has written and come up with at least one change related to students and one change that is related to the teacher. You can take about 5 minutes to do, do this activity. So, in many centers I find that people are still waiting for me to say something. So, I am going to say something. Okay, the something is that please turn to your neighbor and talk to your neighbor, do not wait for me to say something. Okay, so, let us move on to the next phase now, which is called the share phase. Okay. So, the coordinators who had come for the coordinators workshop will remember this session which I had taken on think pair share and now they will I think recall what we had done in that session. So, essentially now what is required is that participants should share your student related change and teacher related change with your fellow participants and the coordinator. And the coordinator should share the most frequent answer from your center via the AVU chat. Okay, so, some center has a question saying that what two quantities is not clear, which quantity is not clear. So, the point we want to make is what is increasing as these scenarios increase, what do you find is increasing? I mean, it might be the time that somebody spends or it might be the activity. So, it is really we are not talking about quantities of need not be of the same units. Okay. So, you just have to identify what the quantities are and identify that what are the things that are changing with respect to a student as well as what are the things that are changing with respect to a teacher. So, let me put back the scenario slide while you are sending me your responses. Okay. So, uh, there are a lot of responses that have come in, many of them are good responses. So, let me just talk about a few. So, some of you are have said that student interaction is increasing, faculty involvement is increasing, then some centers are saying that there is less monotonous lecture, there is active participation. So, a lot of people are saying that there is active participation, it is more interaction with the students and thinking and writing by the students are two quantities which are increasing. Okay, time and grasping, time spent and the grasping are two quantities which are increasing, continuous learning for the students learning by doing, somebody is saying that it's learning by doing is happening, okay, teaching time is increasing, even weak students gets involved in the lecture, that is again a point which somebody has made, 
different ideas and solutions will come that's the point which somebody is making now creative assignments can be given every topic can be discussed with real examples so all of these um, let me uh, now stop with the sending your responses on the chat so many of these good responses that have come that most people have noticed that what is happening as this scenario increases so one of the things that is happening in these scenarios is that the amount of time that the students are spending actively with the content instead of sitting passively and listening to the teacher the amount of time that the students are spending actively with engaging with the content that is one main thing that is increasing and the other main thing is that the complexity of situations that the students are dealing with so in the first case the students have no complexity to deal with they simply have to listen they have to really do nothing then when we come to the session 4 the scenario 4 we find that okay students are beginning to clarify their notes with each other and then all the way to students working in taking a decision about what method to use and then how to solve the problem and then actually solving the problem so the second big thing that is increasing is the complexity or with which the students are engaging with the content the time that they are spending and the complexity okay so to summarize many of these ideas what you would have noticed is as i was reading out the responses that came on chat you would have noticed that many of these ideas have already come up in the chat that you have been sending okay so uh, you can't stop with the sending of chat responses so essentially what is changing in the scenario is that students are doing more on their own so there is more doing on their own okay the nature of activities is also becoming more and more meaningful in the sense that it simply starts with look at what your neighbor has written then to say that write something discuss something solve a problem students are more engaged with the content as you go down the scenarios there is more collaboration that happens there is more discussions on the content with each other and finally there is more reflection that is happening so because the students are more engaged with the content there is more reflection about what is it that they are doing which solution is better and so on okay what's happening for the teacher now okay, so for the teacher what's happening is there is much less talking so the teacher from having lectured for one hour is now lecturing only for 20 minutes and then facilitating a discussion so the teacher is becoming more of a facilitator in class but on the other hand the teacher has to do some work to think of these activities what will the student do so the teacher has to put in more thought outside of the class it's not it's no longer possible for the teacher to just come to the class because the teacher is an expert in the topic and simply start lecturing so it's no longer uh, possible for the teacher to do that the teacher has to spend a lot more time outside of class in order to come up with these activities which make the student engage with the content so all this is fine all this is what is happening we have looked at scenarios we have looked at what is changing in the scenario and so on so now the question that naturally arises is that why what's the big deal okay so the real big deal here is that there is more active learning that happens in the classroom okay. so the next question that we may have is that what is the advantage so before we do that let us look at what exactly is the meaning of active learning so active learning is an approach to teaching and learning whose goal is to engage students with the content okay. why are specific activities designed by the teacher that get students to talk write reflect and express their thinking okay, so what we just now did as scenarios and think pair share is itself an active learning exercise because you had to think about the uh, methods and then you had to think about what was increasing and then you had to share what you had come up with so that itself is an example of an active learning uh, activity so there are some requirements of these active learning strategies the first one is that the instructor creates carefully designed activities that require the students to talk write and reflect and express their thinking and most of the students go beyond listening copying of notes and execution of prescribed procedures the other two, two points so many of us may feel that we are already doing this you know we may, we may feel that oh i give a problem for pre 
students to solve. So I do a tutorial in between in my class. Okay. So many of those are valid strategies for engaging the student. However, in order to qualify to be called an active learning strategy, the strategy has to be explicitly based on theories of learning. Okay. So there are very various theories of how uh, people learn and uh, the strategy that is based on theories of learning for example which ensures that uh, not too much cognitive overload happens or which ensures that the there is a zone of proximal development that takes place okay so the strategies based on theories of learning are called active learning strategies and also these strategies are evaluated repeatedly through empirical research so there are a lot of studies that take place to compare these strategies with traditional lecturing and determine is there actually any benefit of doing these activities. So benefit in fact can be uh, considered from various perspectives. Benefit does not simply mean that does it help the student to score more marks in the exam. That is just one way of a technique being more beneficial. There could be benefits for example like students feel more engaged in the classroom. There could be benefits like students uh, are more motivated to work in that subject okay, or students find the teacher interesting. So these are all other types of benefits that we can also measure through empirical research. So many informal strategies may have the goal of engaging students but to be termed as active learning they need to meet the above requirements. Okay, so and here are some references from where you can learn more about the definition. Okay, so now let us do a question. So the question is that the teacher lectures initially, every 20 minutes the teacher pauses and asks, do you have any doubts? Okay. Three students raise their hands and the teacher resumes the lecture. Okay. So what I am going to do is, I am going to post this question on the AVU poll and uh, participants can indicate your answer to your uh, coordinator and coordinator can share the answer through this poll. So let me just create the question. So let us see what the responses are. We have about 97 responses with 45 saying yes and about 50 saying no. I will just give it another half a minute for the remaining centers also to send their response. Okay, so now 260 centers that are here, we have responses from nearly 230 centers where 120 centers are saying that the teacher is doing active learning and 100 centers are saying that the teacher is not doing active learning. Okay, so let us move on. The important thing now is there is a recall on what is active learning. So active learning is instructor creates carefully designed activities that require students to talk, write, reflect and express their thinking. Okay. So majority of the students go beyond listening, copying of notes, execution of prescribed procedures. Okay. So now that we have seen this definition, okay, what I am going to do is I am going to do the poll again. Okay. So we will keep this slide on, I will give you a minute to look at this slide where which gives the definition of active learning where one the instructor has to create activities that requires the students to write and express their thinking and two the students go beyond you know copying of notes asking of doubts and they actually do something with the content. Okay. So what I am going to do now is in the previous instance we had the result of the poll as nearly 50 percent each with the yes answers actually being a little higher. What I am going to do is I am going to poll the same question again and now let us see what the responses are. So what we have is this definition, keep in mind now this is the definition, okay, the instructor creates activities that requires the students to write and express their thinking and students go beyond simply asking for clarifications and actually engage with the content in terms of solving some problem or discussion and so on. So let us see what the result of the poll is now. After having revisited the definition of active learning, so it appears that the result has not changed very significantly as a result of looking at the definition. 
Okay, so let me just now tell you that the answer here is no. Okay. So, those of you who were thinking that the answer is yes, you need to revisit saying, okay, what is it that this teacher is doing to make students write or talk or express their thinking? And the second thing is, you need to also ask, what is it, what is the student doing beyond simply asking a clarification question? Okay. So, that is why the answer in this case is no. And, yeah. So, the instructor has to create carefully designed activities that require students to talk, write and reflect their thinking. Okay. And majority of the students need to go beyond listening, copying out. So, neither, so this is not majority. When three students in the class are simply asking questions, first of all, that is not majority. And second of all, they are also not going beyond listening or asking clarification questions. Okay. So, both of these things, from the instructor's side, the carefully designed activities that require students to reflect their thinking and majority of the students being going beyond listening, both of these are not happening in this instance where the teacher simply pauses and asks, do you have any doubts? Okay. So, that is why this scenario is not an example of active learning. So, to summarize again, the requirement of active learning strategies is that instructor has to create activities that require students to talk, write, reflect and express their thinking and majority of the students have to go beyond simply listening or asking clarifications. Then it is based on theories of learning and evaluated repeatedly through empirical research. So, now let us look at some of these techniques. Okay. So, before looking at the advantages of active learning itself, so let us look at some standard points that we might have in our mind. So, for example, I spend a lot of time preparing lectures, okay. many of us do that and typically we spend about 4 hours of preparation or anywhere from 4 to 8 hours of preparation for a 1 hour class. right? I deliver my lectures smoothly. So, all these are true for me also. I show them demos and videos. I often pause to ask students if they have understood the material. Okay. Students can even interrupt me with doubts. I never hesitate to answer students' questions. Okay, so, all of these are actions which any good teacher would take in the classroom. Okay, anybody who is diligent about their teaching and about anybody who is keenly interested in students learning the subject well would do all of these things. Okay. So, the question here is that why isn't this enough? So, the point is that we point is not that we should stop doing this, we do need to do all of this. But the point is, so this is a necessary condition, but it is not a sufficient condition. Why is it not enough? So, let us look at some empirical results, so which will bring us to the why of active learning. So, here is one result. So, this may take you a little bit of time to process the material on the slide. So, let me just help you with understanding what is being said there. Okay. So, there was an experiment that was conducted. In one case, so there were two videos of the same instructor teaching the same subject. So, same instructor and same subject, there were two groups that were created. For one group, the instructor spoke very fluently. He did a great job of delivery of the lecture. So, spoke fluently, did not take notes, stood properly, maintained eye contact with the students. So, essentially did all of what was there here, which we feel is key to helping students to understand. In the other video, it was the same instructor in the same topic, but in this case, the instructor spoke very haltingly, you know, started saying a lot of, uh, you know, this is how it happens and so spoke very disfluently and then often looked at notes, had poor body language did not make eye contact with the students, all of that. So, this is actually a bad lecture, so to speak. Okay. So, badly delivered lecture, but the content and the topic everything was the same. Okay. Then what they did in this experiment was that they measured what is the student performance by a test on the topic. Okay. It turns out that what would we expect, we would expect that group 1 should do better than group 2 because the instructor did a much superior job of 
delivering the lecture. The instructor spoke very fluently, maintained eye contact and did all of that. Okay. So, the expected thing is that learning should be greater for group 1 and learning should be less for group 2. Okay. It turns out that even if you ask students, students feel that they have learnt more in the group 1, but if you look at the exam performance, it turns out that the, the performance is the same for both the groups. So, the actual learning, so there is a difference between what is called perceived learning, perceived learning is how much I think I have learnt and actual learning, actual learning is how much I am able to demonstrate in the exam. So, the perceived learning, I may think that I have learnt, but unless I am asked to demonstrate through some kind of a test, I really do not know how much I have learnt. So, the actual learning is measured by the test, whereas the perceived learning can be measured by asking students how much do you think, did you understand this lecture well and questions like that. Okay. So, it turns out that the actual learning for both the groups turned out to be the same. So, basic point that is being made here is that better quality of delivery of lectures does not lead to better learning. Okay. So, the point to understand is that we are continuously focusing on ourselves. As teachers, we are always focusing on ourselves saying, how can I improve my lecture, how can I improve my lecture, what example can I give, how can I speak, where should I modulate my voice, how should I pause, you know, where should I suddenly tell a joke, lot of things like that, we keep focusing on ourselves. But what this experiment shows is that while that is a good thing, it is good that you do all that, but it does not necessarily lead to better learning. Okay. This experiment does not mean that it is ok to lecture badly, that is not the interpretation of the experiment. The experiment simply means that continuously improving the delivery of the lecture does not lead to better learning. So, now if we compare lectures with active learning strategies, so for example, one of that we have already seen two active learning strategies in this session, one was the think pair share and the other was the poll that we just did. Okay. So, comparing both of these things, so these are topics from physics of topics of force, acceleration and velocity. So, now if you look at how much did the students were able to score before the instruction, before any uh, instruction, this is actually called a pre-test. Okay. So, this black mark that you see which is the lowest in all the three cases indicates the pre-test and then the in between one which is the grey one which shows how much they improved after the lecture. Okay. So, in this case, this is the traditional lecture, by traditional lecture what we mean is that the teacher gives the lecture and periodically ask students did you understand or periodically ask students do you have any doubts. So, then you find that the increase is appears to be marginal. Okay. On the other hand, when there are some active learning techniques that are done like for example, think pair share or making students debate on a topic or making students to solve a real life problem. What you find is that the gain is much more much larger. So, it, and clearly even without the statistical numbers in this case, it one can believe that this gain is going to be uh, statistically significant as well as it is going to be a reasonable effect size. Okay. So, what we find is that the gain is pretty large when we are doing active learning as compared to simply doing uh, traditional instruction. Okay. So, let me tell you about one more such large scale study. So, this study was conducted across 6542 students and over 62 courses in physics and many of these instructors who taught all these courses were had won best teacher awards in their institute and so on. Okay. So, out of these 14 of them did traditional lecture and 48 of them did active learning strategies. Okay. So, what do we mean by traditional lecture now? The definition of traditional lecture includes asking of doubts and also includes allowing students to ask doubts. Okay. So, includes saying ki do you understand? So, giving a great lecture with pauses and asking students did you understand and clarifying their doubts is a traditional lecture and doing less of lecturing and doing more of problem solving and such activities in the classroom is an active learning strategy. 
So what we find here is that in the case of when we again once again use the similar pre-test and a post-test model, we find that how much did the students learn? So just like what we had seen, what was the difference between the students knowledge before the lecture and what was the difference between the students knowledge after the lecture. So this is measured by a value called gain. Okay, so this is the formula, we will not go into the details of how this formula is computed, what it implies and all. So all that we want to understand here is that this gain measures what is the difference, how much has the student actually learned in the, as a result of the lecture. Okay. So it turns out that when people are doing traditional lecturing, this is the gain actually, the x axis here is the gain. Okay and the y-axis is the fraction of courses that are having that gain. Okay. So if you look at the x-axis, what you find is that for traditional lectures, even though these were excellent teachers, there is the gain is capped at 0.28. So however good delivery that the teacher may be doing, because the students are simply sitting there passively and listening and they are thinking that they, they are able to follow the lecture. The actual performance of the student in the exam is not affected very significantly. On the other hand, if you look at active learning strategies, okay, you find that there is a huge spectrum of gains. So the gain can be all the way from 0.22 to 0.7. So what this shows is that active learning even if it is combined with slightly less than perfect lecturing, does have a lot of gain. On the other hand, the moment we start introducing active learning a little more seriously in our courses, you know, the gain increases much significantly. So this is basically another representation of this graph that we saw earlier, okay, where the active learning has a lot of gain over compared to traditional instruction. So only thing is in this case we are talking about a few experiments, whereas in this case these measurements are made over 62 courses and 6000 students and variety of institutions and variety of teachers. Okay? So the point that is being made here is basically that it is desirable to incorporate active learning strategies into our classroom. Okay? So we may be excellent lecturers. We may have a lot of interest, we may be able to give fantastic lectures, we may be able to engage the students attention very well, we may have them completely listening to us for the entire class. Even for such instructors, it is desirable to incorporate active learning strategies because even if you are that instructor, the gain as far as these results which are a very large study show that will be around 0.3, whereas if the same instructor were to incorporate some active learning strategies, the chances are that that instructor's gain will be around 0.6 to 0.7. Okay? So that is the key point that we are making here. Okay. So now let us look at some basis of active learning strategies. So what is the instructor basically doing here? The instruction is informed and explicitly guided by research regarding students' pre-instruction knowledge state and learning process. Okay, so this may sound like a very complex sentence for people not used to education technology terminology. Basically what this means is that you create your lecture or activity that you do in the classroom based on what the student knows already and also based on how the learning process takes place. So the basis is that, for example, specific learning difficulties related to particular concepts. So there may be data on, on the fact that, for example, here students typically find recursion as a difficult concept to understand. Okay? So students often confuse the concept of recursion with the concept of iteration, which are two entirely different concepts, but simply because there is the notion of some sort of a loop happening in both the cases students think that this is also a loop. Okay? So that is a specific learning, learning difficulty related to a particular concept. Then there are specific ideas and knowledge elements that are potentially productive and useful. So for example, you may feel that even though it is computer programming, 
it is still desirable for students to learn about sorting. So that learning about sorting is a specific knowledge element that is useful for students across a lot of disciplines. Okay? And then it takes about uh, students beliefs, what they need to do in order to learn and their general reasoning process. So now once again to summarize at this point, what we have is that active learning, what we have seen so far is what is active learning? Active learning is basically getting the students to engage with the content, getting them to do some activity in the classroom which forces them to work with the content and discover how much they have understood. Okay? Why should we do active learning? That also we have seen that there are great benefits of doing this. The learning gains, most important thing that we are interested in is for our students to score well in the exams. And we find that even in that case, there are a lot of learning gains. And now what we want to see is how do we do this in our classroom. So let us say we are great instructors in, when it comes to lecturing. Let us see how to incorporate active learning in the classroom. Okay. So the key elements of active learning strategies here are the students are going to engage in problem solving activity during the class time, okay. not after the class time, it is during the class time, the during is important. And the problems are posed in a variety of contexts, often in real life contexts. So specific student ideas are elicited and addressed and often students are asked to figure things out for themselves. Okay, so students are given open ended problems, they are asked to figure it out for themselves, they are asked to express their reasoning explicitly, students work collaboratively and they receive rapid feedback on their work. Okay. So here are some strategies that can help you to implement active learning in programming. Okay. Here are some things that we can do. So we will do a little bit more of this in the uh, following sessions, but right now on this particular slide I will just list some of these uh, activities and do some examples of them. Okay. So for example, one thing that you could do in the classroom is to pose a problem and ask students to begin the problem solution. Okay. So for example, you may say that I have, uh, you know, I, I given an array, find a mechanism by which the array can be sorted in increasing order. Okay. So you could ask students to begin the problem solution. So what will happen in this case is that the students will actually uh, start saying that, okay, I will find the smallest element of the array. So some students will come up with one of the sorting algorithms. Some other student may come up with a different sorting algorithm. So the beginning of the problem solution can start and based on what is your intention, you can choose one of those steps that the students have given to then keep them engaged as you go on in that class. The next strategy that you could use or another strategy that you could use is ask students to complete the last two steps in the problem. Okay. So in this case, you may say that you may describe a technique at the pseudocode level, for example. You may say that if I am going to do insertion sort, you may describe insertion sort using, using an example and then you may show some code of the insertion sort and say that, okay, what is the final code that has to be written here so that this program works like insertion sort, okay. So that is asking students to complete the last two steps in the problem and this figuring out the next step in the derivation is also a similar strategy. It is not particularly applicable in the context of CS101 because we really do not do too much of derivation in CS101, but it will be applicable in other CS courses for example when there are proofs involved. Okay. Then you could ask students to devise possible reasons for an observation. So in this case it, it could be shown in a video or these observations could be shown as part of your uh, classroom demonstration. So many of us now when we teach computer programming, we do project the actual code blocks or genie or whatever environment that we are using. We do project the actually the execution of a program, right. So what we could do is we could show a program, we could show its output and ask students to devise saying, okay, why did this program give this output, which will be a mechanism to engage students with the content. The other thing that we can do is instead of simply showing them the result and asking them to devise the reason, we can pause the program and ask students to predict the outcome of the program. Okay. 
So again, in this case, the program can be shown in a video or an animation, or you could actually do a live demo of the code execution. Then another method that you could use is to ask students to brainstorm a list of methods to solve a design problem. So for example, you may say that, okay, I want to design a database. I want to implement the contacts information on a phone. So this can be coming towards the end of a uh, computer programming course. And you can ask students to come up with a list of methods saying, okay, what data structures will you use to store this information? What else will you do in order to solve the problem? And then finally, you can get students to debate the pros and cons of various methods. Okay, so now this debate actually is a good tool. I mean, debating pros and cons of various methods in uh, technical terms, it actually gets students to work at what is called the evaluate level of the cogn cognitive levels. Okay? So it makes students go beyond simply understanding what the teacher is saying, beyond the understand level, beyond being able to replicate what the teacher has said in the exam, but to actually think about what are the pros and cons. So the, so this again, you could do, as, a, as an example, what I had already mentioned, that you could say when to use an array versus when to use a linked list. So such a debate could be done in the classroom. So these are some ways, some activities that you could use to implement active learning in your class. So what we will be doing in today's sessions is we will be taking two such, three such activities. One is called think pair share. Another is called peer instruction and both of them we will combine together in the last one which is called a flipped classroom. Okay? And we will be talking about these activities in the sessions. You will also be doing exercises during the sessions as well as in the lab regarding these activities and creating your own questions which you can use in your classroom. Okay. So now let us do one more activity which is also a think pair share activity. So now what happens is that in this activity, uh, let me read out for those of, okay, you get excited about active learning strategies that you learned in this workshop so far and you go back to your college and tell your co colleagues about it, okay. Your colleague, however, expresses this concern that students are used to being lectured, okay. They will not like to do anything more in class. So active learning strategies will not work, okay. So now the question is, do you agree with your colleague? And write your opinion along with your reason behind it. That is the what we need to do. So now, by now you are familiar with this concept of think pair share. In the think phase, you have to think individually and come up with your own reason and then only go on to the pair and the share phases. Okay? So we will give you a minute to think about whether you agree with this statement that students are used to being lectured. They will not like to do anything more in class. So active learning strategies will not work. Somebody has made that statement. So the question is that, do you agree with it or not? And if you agree, why? If you don't agree, why not? So moving on to the next phase, check if your partner or your neighbor shares the same opinion as you. Okay? So if you both have different opinions, one of you says that it will work, one of you says it will not work, then discuss your respective reasons with each other. Okay? So if one of you, if both of you are saying that it will work, then you are perhaps okay. But if one of you is saying that it will not work, you know, come up with one way to address the problem raised. So for example, one person may say that students are used to being lectured, they will not do anything, so active learning will not work. And so come up with a way to ensure that students will do something more than simply listening to lectures in class. So again, I will give you some 2-3 minutes to do this. Okay, so I am already seeing a lot of responses on the chat forum saying that active learning, most pe many people think that it will be difficult to implement and so on. Okay, so now as a class, what we want to do is we want to devise ways to address this concern. So the question is no longer whether you agree with it or not. So the question is that, let us say, assume that your, class, your uh, college management and principal have discovered that there are great benefits to active learning and they are saying that all of you must implement active learning and now we have to come up with ways to address this fact that students are used to being lectured. So irrespective of whether you agree with active learning or not, 
we have to find a way what are ways by which we can get students to do work in class rather than simply listen okay one of you has posted a good question about active learning which i will uh, take up in about 5 minutes saying that okay how much time does the active learning activity itself take okay so let me start reading out some of the responses one of the responses if students are motivated enough then they will be they will definitely participate another response is that we can do traditional lecturing half the class and then active learning the other half of the class some people are saying according to the hours allotted and work schedule it is a bit difficult so i will address that point later on others are giving examples like possible ways are brainstorming if we follow active learning we can do more number of classes it will help okay, so coming back to what is it that we can get students to do how do we get students to do okay so there is somebody else who is saying 80% of teaching and 20% of activity so the active learning mechanism actually says the opposite saying that 20% of teaching and 80% of activity okay so uh, we can stop sending responses on chat and the key point here is that you need students to have some buy in into this technique okay into active learning why are you doing this in class when they are used to coming to class and simply sitting there and you know sometimes taking notes or sometimes simply play playing with their uh, devices now suddenly we are saying that turn to your neighbor do this do that and so on so what is important is to get the students to buy in so one way of doing this is to create it by explaining why you are doing active learning and better still we can demonstrate why you are doing active learning by doing some activity so which is what we have done in this session itself when we have had two think pair share activities and we have had one peer instruction activity which is the poll that we conducted okay so we have actually demonstrated how to do active learning so many uh many of you are having questions that how to do active learning in a cs class so some of that we will take up in the next session let me do some of the other questions here so let me read out the question so one question is that sometimes you have to complete our syllabus within a given time and active learning requires a lot of time so how can we estimate our time while delivering lectures through active learning strategy okay so this is a common uh query that is there in most of our minds so when we started implementing active learning techniques we also had the same query in our minds okay so the point here is what you will find once you start implementing active learning is that you actually have to do less so even though you may have budgeted let's say two or three classes for a particular topic the moment you flip it around and you get students to work on the topic you will find that you don't have to do so much lecturing so students themselves will be able to get a lot of the advanced topics on their own because of the activities that you have designed rather than because of the explanations that you are giving okay so it turns out that the syllabus gets completed not only in time but it can also get completed at a far greater depth than if we were to do traditional lecturing so this is an actual finding and uh, the only way for you to verify this for yourself is to right now believe the finding and try it out yourself otherwise no amount of you know my showing data or my telling you that i do this in my class i have seen it and all that may may not be as useful as you trying it out in your class many of you have given good responses to the uh, think pair share activity so like for example somebody is saying that active learning improves the class performance as non participating students get involved and everybody learns a lot from the process somebody else is saying that active learning is possible either during the lab session or in few lectures during the entire semester so here again i would like to point out that active learning is not something which you do separately from your class okay so if you do active learning only in a few lectures you will find that it does not work because what will happen is the students are not used to the technique so if you just do it as an experiment in one lecture the students also need time to get used to what you are doing so you need to 
implement this technique. So, even if the active learning is something as simple as posing a question, having students to vote on it, getting them to discuss and then having them to vote again. Unless you do it repeatedly, the students will not get used to the technique. So, saying that okay, I will do lecturing for most of my lectures and once in a while I will do some active learning is unlikely to work. Okay. There is a question which says, is active learning possible for every subject? The answer is yes, but we will not go into anything beyond uh, computer programming or computer science as far as this workshop is concerned. So, many of you seem to have this concern that if active learning is followed, then syllabus completion will be the problem. Okay. So, let me repeat here that if when you implement active learning, what will what you will find is that you have to do less of lecturing. Students discover a lot of information on their own. So, syllabus completion is unlikely to be a problem, even though it may seem at this point that yes, it might be a problem, unless you once you start implementing it, that is when you will discover that it is really not a problem. So, somebody else is asking the question that is it okay to do this for 25 minutes of a in a class. So, that is actually correct that in a one hour class if you do about 20 to 30 minutes of active learning and you know start with a 10 minute uh, lecturing, do some 20, 30 minutes of active learning, again summarize with a 10 minute of lecturing, something of that sort is actually a good uh, plan. Okay, let me look at a few questions and then we will take a break. Okay, there is an important point here which says that the active learning will work only for less number of students in the class, so that every student gets more time. So, again here the point is that active learning is not about the teacher individually giving time to all the students. Okay, so, active it is not necessary that you have to talk to each and every student. As long as you are able to get the students to talk to each other, that is also active learning. So, they also learn from their peers. So, as it is, it is anyway happening when they are preparing for exams. So, what we are doing is, we are just simply bringing it into the classroom and carrying out that activity also. So, to give you a concrete example, I have implemented these techniques in a class of 250 students for computer programming. And even in such a large class, you will find that students talk to each other, active learning works pretty well. It is I do not have to really put in any of my time into making the class, making students talk to each other. Okay, so, many people are still saying that it is not possible to have active learning in all lectures, but we can have two or three sessions in a semester. So, let me re-emphasize that if we have active learning only two or three times a semester, it is not much different from doing a problem solving tutorial. Okay, so, in that case, you are better off simply doing the problem solving tutorial. So, do trying it out as uh, something which you will occasionally do is unlikely to give you the benefit. What is important is to do it let us say at least in every alternate class to begin with, if not in every class. So, what I do in when I teach computer programming is that I have at least two activities in each class. So, even if you and there is really no difficulty my syllabus gets completed much before schedule and all of that. Okay, students go to much greater depth. For example, they do sorting algorithms, they do linked list, they do implementation of stack. All of this is slightly beyond the regular syllabus of uh, computer programming. Okay. So, this happens because I have at least two activities to, do, to be done in every class. So, even if you do not want to do two activities in every class, if you plan your course in such a way that you have at least one activity in every class or one activity in every two classes, then you will start seeing the benefits of active learning. If you have one or two activities a semester, you are not going to see anything, uh, any benefit out of this technique. Students are going to simply say that okay, this is another tutorial or some one of those problem solving uh, sessions that the instructor is having. Okay. So, how to convince the colleagues, our colleagues regarding the implications of active learning strategy? This is again an important question that many of us, if we are implementing it and all our colleagues are doing other things, our colleagues first of all may ask that why are you doing all this? Secondly, what will, what might happen is there may be a lot of talking happening in your class and people may think that you really are not teaching, but something else is going on in the class. So, the easiest way to convince your colleagues is to get the students 
to see the benefit of active learning. So once the students see the benefit of this technique, they in turn start asking other teachers also to do such strategies in their classroom. Okay. So this is one of the things that is happening at IIT Bombay also, where students write in the course evaluation that this think pair share method was excellent and more instructors should start using such a method. And then it turns out that more and more people start having buy-in into these techniques. Okay, so at this point, I'll uh, stop with the queries because I'm getting more opinions rather than queries. So some people are saying that, okay, we think active learning will not work in sections more than 30 students. So at this point, I can only uh, say that active learning does work. There are studies which show that it does work in large classes also. And there are mechanisms of implementing it in large classes. Okay. And all of these we will uh, see uh, in the subsequent sessions. Okay, let me just wait a minute or so to see if there are any other questions which we can. Okay, there is a question on how do we conduct active learning for data structures that is difficult to understand. So one way of conducting this for motivating such data structures, so the way I do it, I can only answer from the point of view of what I would do. So the way I do it is by posing a problem which motivates the need for the data structure. Okay. Which, so suppose they have learnt a bunch of data structures till then. So let's say they have learnt about arrays, they have learnt about linked lists, and now you want to teach them about the data structure of a queue. Okay. So what I do is pose a problem which motivates the need for a queue where we find that this array or linked list or whatever data structures that they have learnt is not exactly very efficient. So the need for the data structure once they understand, then it's very easy to simply tell them that a queue is nothing but a first in first out kind of a mechanism. You can implement it in either using an array or using a linked list and that's the way that data structures can be addressed. Okay, so there is another question here which is asking how to measure the outcome of active learning apart from pre and post survey. So this is a good question. There are multiple ways in which to measure this. So one way is to measure the perception of the students. Okay? So the students, you can conduct a survey to find out what do students think about it. Do they feel that it helps them to understand the subject better? Do they feel that it helps them to uh, be more engaged with the content or pay more attention in the class or motivates them to come to class? So that is one set of uh, metrics can be around this perception metrics. Another set of metrics can be from the uh, perspective of the instructor where the instructor's feeling that, okay, did it help making my class more interactive? Did it help me in reducing the amount of effort that I put in during the class? So the instructor, instructor's perception can be another thing that is measured. And the third thing can be actual performance, which is the how much are the students storing, uh, scoring in the exams on that topic. So that's, those are ways in which the outcome of active learning can be measured. Okay, so there is one more point which is saying that okay, active learning itself is a time consuming activity. So again I would like to re-emphasize here that if you think of active learning as something that you do in addition to lectures, then it will appear to be a time consuming activity. If you think of it as something that substitutes for your extensive lecturing and where you reduce the amount of time that you lecture but you create activities which help students to learn the concept and then only have to, your only task is to then summarize what they have learned. Okay. So in that case, the active learning does not take more time. So let me give you a concrete example here. In one class, like when I was talking about sorting algorithms just a while ago, so in one of the classes, I did give this question of given an array, what are the ways in which you will sort the array as a think pair share activity. So students had to initially think of and come up with some method of sorting without worrying about how the code looks. Okay, so many of them would come up with insertion sort, some others would come up with selection sort, some others would come up with uh, any of the one of the other uh, sorting mechanisms. Okay. So nobody really comes up with quick sort in such a question. Now, in the pair phase, you say that, okay, now two of you together 
write a little bit of the C++ code for the sorting algorithm that you have chosen, okay, be it insertion, selection, whatever, okay. So many of them even come up with uh, bubble sort and uh, some of the basic algorithms they discover. So at the end of one class, which is maybe an hour or slightly more than one hour, when you have finished discussing the ideas that the students have come up with and you have finished talking about how the code should look like, what you find is that the entire class has now learnt three or four sorting algorithms. Now if this were to be done in pure lecturing, what you would have to do is you would have to spend time setting up the problem, talking about describing insertion sort, describing selection sort, okay, describing bubble sort, describing merge sort. So this actually would at least take about two hours of lecturing to simply just describe how these sorting mechanisms work. Okay, so on the other hand, since we, I did this as an active learning uh, strategy, a think pair share activity, it took 20 minutes for the activity to happen, wherein different groups came up with different sorting algorithms. Another 20 minutes for the discussion, where groups were able to see the other, others' ideas of how the sorting algorithm works. And my finally summarizing and doing a code walkthrough of these sorting algorithms in the last 20 minutes. So in about an hour, this entire topic of sorting algorithms could be covered. So that's why the point is that active learning techniques don't take additional time provided you reduce the amount of time that you actually do in uh, lecturing. Okay, so there's one more question which is uh, important which says, is it enough to use such activities in the first few lectures to create interest for the subject? So once again, why do you want to stop with simply creating interest for the subject? Yes, such activities help to create interest for the subject, but once you have created the interest, you might as well continue to exploit the power of the activities where students are talking to each other and solving problems in, in the class in order to get more than simply interest for the subject. Okay, so I think this is a good time for us to stop. And uh, many of these other queries that we see, we will also be addressing in the subsequent sessions. So instead of simply bombarding you with all the information right now, I think uh, this is a good time. So it's about been about one and a half an hour since we started. So we'll stop here. We'll take a break for tea, whatever time is tea, and we will uh, reconvene immediately after tea.